Hello again, one and all. It's your boy, Matt. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thanks for joining me. Yes, we're staring at the beautiful B-52 bomber, taxiing and preparing to take off on a mission. Strategic bombing or tactical threat bombing is a very interesting aviation topic to discuss. It's something that is actively going on today, not actual bombing, but the threat of, you know, strategic bombing is always present. It's something that silently goes on in the background that none of us really pay attention to until you see scenes like this on the US news. U.S. Air Force fighter jets intercepted two Russian bombers off the coast of Alaska. The U.S. says the intercept took place in international airspace yesterday. Uh, they say it was safe and professional. Illinois Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He's joining us from Ottawa, Illinois, serves in the U.S. Air Force uh, right now. The reserve served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, what do you make of this uh, development? Uh, a statement from the North American Command saying two Russian Tu-95 Bear bombers were intercepted off the coast of Alaska on Monday by two U.S. F-22 fighter jets. The fighter jets were scrambled by NORAD. The intercept took place in international airspace. Uh, uh, walk us through what all this means, especially at such a sensitive so this time right now, Congressman. Well, so this is basically, you know, I hate to admit it, I hate to say it, but it's almost a, a rejuvenation of the Cold War. And, you know, not where we have thousands of nukes pointed at each other on a hair trigger, but this is a show of force by the Russians uh, to show they're still here, they're still operating, this is what they used to do back in the day. And there's a lot of benefits to them to doing it. They can see what our air defenses do, they can map out how our intercepts occur. Uh, you know, this is... So there you have it. I mean, these kind of news articles come out a lot. There was recently, in the beginning of this footage, you saw a, uh, a Russian jet doing the exact same thing to a B-52. And it's back and forth. It's a cat and mouse game. To be brutally honest here, you know, the Americans are doing it, other nations are doing it, Russia's doing it. It is what it is. It's part of, um, you know, testing a nation's uh, capability, strengths, kind of, you know, somewhat poking the bear, literally, with bear bombers. Um, and personally, I actually find it quite fascinating uh, learning about why these kind of things are occurring and, and the kind of capabilities and the strike capabilities that are available to any one nation. Now, of course, uh, you know, with the United States, the B-52 being one of the uh, key bombers of taking part in these kind of missions is a jet that is here to stay. And, you know, the advances in satellite and rocket technologies have distended and defined the power of air power into aerospace power. In simple words, aerospace power signifies a nation's capability to exploit air and space in support of its national objectives. A logical extension of this idea is the ability to deny or degrade a similar capability for the enemy, which is basically kind of what's happening. Aerial bombing of enemy targets with strategic value played obviously a huge role in World War II, but the terms, quote, strategic bomber is attained on a new connotation of a currency of nuclear projection as part of a triad. But do we still need strategic bombers? Do we need these long-range bombing missions that are still flying day-to-day -day without us even knowing? While the nuclear factor inhibits a full-scale war, and the fact that most of these nations taking part in these kind of missions really would never take upon it to engage one another, it renders conflict in the form of a limited war a possibility. The capability of using strike aircraft for bombing strategic targets over enemy territory in thus is an essential element of aerospace power, and it doesn't always have to be the big guys. Little jets are now being capable of launching just as much of a threat or capability as some of the larger bombers. Is this capability embodied in a strategic bomber? And what exactly is a strategic bomber? Let's start off with a little bit of history. The B-17 could deliver huge payloads in World War II over Nazi Germany due to its massive range. But with the first atom bombs being dropped in the end of World War II and the advent of the B-52, the strategic bomber acquired a refined capability. More sophisticated strategic bombers like the B-1 and the B-2 emerged and added the bombing muscle of NATO, while the USSR produced matching bombers of the Topolov family. These large bombers, besides their capability of carrying nuclear bombs, were also strategic in another sense. The huge conventional payload they could carry and deliver in a concentrated manner, largely on targets deep inside enemy territory but occasionally nearer to the battle areas. However, due to remarkable advances in fighter aircraft technology and performance, there was a huge shift in the delineation between the bomber and its strategic connotation and the fighter aircraft, which was till recently a tactical instrument of war. 
Today's multi-role fighters operating in suitable ensembles can deliver clustered and concentrated conventional but precision guided weapons with the same strategic effect. Conversely, modern aircraft supported by air-to-air -air refueling can be used to deliver swift and very efficient pinpoint strikes on enemy strategic assets, including nuclear missile bases. So is the classic strategic bomber a dying concept? The answer to that question would appear to be in the complete negative. If ongoing developments in the leading technological advanced aerospace powers are any indication. For instance, a recent conflict that involved heavy tactical bombing or strategic bombing was the US Air Force's B-52s, which were deployed in Qatar for airstrikes against ISIS, the first mission being performed against an ISIS weapons storage facility. B-52s, B-1s and B-2s were seen on the same tarmac at Anderson Air Force Base in Guam back in the day, a unique occasion as three types of strategic bombers were in the US Pacific Command Territory simultaneously for the first time ever. Now, although these deployments were not intended for use in anger and only as part of the annual US-South Korea war games, the message about the durability of strategic bomber is loud and clear. Also, in March 2013, following increased tensions in the Korean Peninsula, a B-2 was flown all the way from the US to South Korea only to drop inert munitions during a training exercise as a demonstration to North Korea of US bomber capability. The latest and deadliest weapon system to be mounted on board of the bomber B-52H Stratofortress is the Lockheed Martin AGM-158 Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, or the JASSM, JASM, I kind of like that, JASM, it's kind of like jazzy, yeah, which is the new long-range radar-evading standoff cruise missile designed to destroy hostile air defenses before aircraft are within range. This capability is a typical type of the new generation of precision-guided weapons that is replacing the old dumb bombs carried by strategic bombers. While the B-52 entered service in 1955, and at least some of them are expected to last into the 2040s, the B-1 was inducted in 1986, and while the composite material stealth heavy B-2 was delivered to the US Air Force in 1993, they're still going strong. The B-1 and B-2, however, are expected to go on even beyond the B-52 lifetime. Meanwhile, the US is not content with the bombers on its inventory, and it's on the way to producing a more modern one, exploiting all the leading edge technologies of stealth, power plants, airframe materials, avionics and precision guided weapons. The new strategic bomber is to be developed by Northrop Grumman, who has competed and won the contract against Boeing and has, using its huge amount of contract power, is giving the US Air Force a perceived need for a long range strike bomber, otherwise known as the LRSB. It will be called the B-21 Raider and is expected to enter service around 2025. The initial order of 100 B-21s may be doubled as some of the estimates as older B-52s and B-1s need to be replaced. Thus, the US will have B-21s and B-2s, both Northrop designs, as the strategic bomber force. The nuclear-capable bombers of the US serve under an integrated Air Force Global Space Command which has under it all the nuclear bombers, nuclear missiles and personnel. But what about Russia? Russia has been working on the PAKDA, which is the stealth bomber as a launch platform for strategic and nuclear conventional missiles and cruise missiles as a host precision guided munition platform, including hypersonic missiles. The PAKDA project was launched in 2009 with the intent of producing a single type of strategic bomber to replace the current TU-160, TU-95MS and TU-22M3. It's expected to make its first flight sometime between 21 and 22, with the first delivery starting in 2023. Now, of course, many of you will be aware that the Russian fleet of bombers is extensive and beautiful. It is now looking at upgrading 10 copies of the new Tu-160M to even more operational capabilities. Close to home, China last year disclosed its new generation of H-6K strategic bombers equipped with the DH-20 land attack cruise missile. Now, Russia certainly has not shied away from its own strategic bomber designs. The Tu-160, the Soviet-era strategic bomber designed by Tupolev Design Bureau in the Soviet Union in the 1970s, is the largest and heaviest Mach-2 supersonic military aircraft ever built. These bombers are used to great effect to test the capabilities around the world, particularly of that in Alaska. It is a very prominent strategic landmass for the United States and of course a very capable area to mount any kind of strike and advance. The United States has taken particular attention to defending this location with its own intercepts of these particular type of bombers. 
In June 2010, two Russian Tu-160 bombers completed a record-breaking 23-hour patrol covering 18,000 kilometers of flight range. The bombers flew by the borders of Russia, over the Arctic and Pacific Oceans, and finally landed at Engels Base in the Volga region. It's noted in particular that the United States, when intercepting or checking up on these kind of aircraft, place a little red star in their Alaskan Forces command base to show that they have actually checked on or intercepted any kind of aircraft, and the stars are mounted across the wall at the Operations Command Center to show that they have actually intercepted that particular aircraft. The eagles represent that the aircraft has been checked in its squawk, so when it's squawking aircraft in the area, it gets a squawk back, and it's almost a bit of a, again, cat and mouse game. The Tu-22M3M has also been upgraded simultaneously to the Tu-22M3M level with considerably improved combat capabilities by Tupolev Aircraft Company. Now both of the strategic bombers will be equipped with communication systems based on the platform of the Su-57 5th generation fighter. An important part of this upgrade package was the inclusion of up to three KH-32 missiles, which are classified as anti-ship missiles, but were also developed to be effective against critical infrastructure targets, including bridges and power plants. That missile allowed the Tu-22M3M to occupy a unique position between strategic and operational tactical roles. Now, the Tu-160 is capable of carrying 12 strategic cruise missiles, the Kh-55MS, which has a maximum range of 3,000 kilometers, and it is armed with a 200 kiloton nuclear warhead. The plane can also carry the Kh-15P, which has a range of 200 kilometers. The kickback can be fitted with a conventional 250k warhead or a nuclear warhead. The aircraft is also capable of carrying a range of aerial bombs with a total rate of up to 40 tons. It's safe to say that the Russian Air Force is really keen on going on the strategic and nuclear capable aircraft, but just as much so with its fighter programs and upgrading them to the capability of launching their own strategic capability. In a naval context, the Russian Air Force is continually pushing its own limits too, to try and keep that strategic capability against naval forces. But is the constant cat and mouse game worth it? Is all of this intercept strategic pushing Placing bombers at long-range targets, checking on one another, waving at one another, passing and flybys, is it all part and parcel of just what modern potential warfare is? Are we looking at the future of the Cold War in a silent context where we're showing a force, flexing our muscles and seeing what can happen? Well, the answer to that is exactly yes. That is the future that we live in. Unfortunately, these kind of situations occur as a standoff to prevent the other from potentially doing something that they don't want them to do. I don't ever see it actually happening, and I really hope to God it never does. The thing that scares me the most in situations of these intercepts and these test of flex muscles is that there could be an accident or something go wrong. In history, some of these situations have occurred. Thankfully, not in today's situation, but the limits continue to be pushed further and further with these kind of intercepts and the way in which strategic bombers and strategic command of these bombers is implemented. And the interesting thing is that these missions are increasing in its complexity and distancing and capability. Recently, in a unique spin on the regularly occurring Bomber Task Force missions in Europe, six US Air Force B-52 strategic bombers flew over 30 NATO nations in Europe and North America on August 28th. This single-day mission titled Allied Sky was intended to demonstrate NATO's enhanced readiness and provide training opportunities aimed at enhancing interoperability for all participating air crews for the US and NATO allies. Allied Sky is the latest iteration of a routine BTF mission that has occurred in the European theatre of operations since 2018, with more than 200 sorties coordinated with allies and partners, and particularly strategic bombers. BTF missions are long planned, are not in response to any current political events occurring in Europe. But of course, when we look at these kind of missions, it's really impressive to see how much capability is there, and what nations can do together when they're actually putting these bombers in the sky. It's safe to say, folks, in the rhetorical sense of me asking the question about this video, do we still need strategic bombers? Yes. It may not be for the nuclear capability, it may not be for the long-range engagements where we're sending bombers upon bombers to engage countries, but when it comes to missions that are required very urgently, with huge capabilities for bombing at one point in one time, sending an aircraft that can fly just around about half the world and get where it needs to be in one or two days is extremely impressive, and the recent missions in ISIS uh, engagements really kind of prove that. 
Going against terrorism is clearly one of the biggest and most strategic missions of today, and being able to put these bombers into the sky and engage these kind of missions is very impressive. Of course, the deterrent levels of strategic bombing is always going to be there, and I'm hoping one day that we don't have to continue flexing our muscles, that our bombers will sit in their hangars not doing much, and we just can go to sleep nicely at night. There are many people, servicemen and women around the world from many nations getting up to do this every single day, whether it be going on these strategic missions or preventing them from happening. It is quite impressive to know that people around the world are protecting us without us even knowing, silently preventing the worst case scenarios. But it does raise a question in regards to the future of these kind of capabilities. Will this be something that will be done behind the desk in the future? Will we be looking at drones to complete these long distance missions? We look at the capabilities of aircraft, fuel, what the aircraft can do in terms of its distance and range, but at the end of the day, one of the biggest factors that prevent us from actually continuing these missions on and on and on is the human factor. People need sleep, they need rest, it's a complex task going on strategic bombing runs and long distance patrols. Even for the fighter crews escorting these bombers and these aircraft, it takes huge amounts of manpower. The future of these kind of deterrent missions may be placed upon computers and drones. We may not be looking at bombers being flew by people. The fighters themselves is a debate that we can talk about another day escorting those bombers, but it's an interesting topic to open up for another video in the future. Can long-range long strategic bombers be taken over by drones? And it's something that we're definitely, I think, going to see in the long term and in the future. Also, with fighter aircraft being able to take over the role of bombers in some regard, it also looks upon the basis of, in the future, do we still need strategic bombers? For me, I would safely say yes, but I think it's one of those questions that's very open-ended and could see huge changes in the future. Guys, I hope you really enjoyed today's video and learned a little bit about strategic bombing, especially in the grand context of what it does and what it can do. If you have your own opinion and context on this kind of weapon system and what it can do and its missions around the world, I'd love to hear from you. For those of you who do serve in the strategic world and working with bombers of these kinds, thank you for what you do. And also for those who are part of the fighter command that are doing their own things to protect these aircraft or intercept around the world, thank you also for what you do. Of course, this video has no political or hindsight to, you know, uh, nations or powers around the world. Very neutral, really just discussing what's going on around the world and the kind of things that, you know, you may not be aware of what's going on with these kind of bombers and strategic bomber commands. Thank you again for watching. If you did enjoy, please leave me a like. I'd love to hear your input. Go to the comment section below. Leave me some, uh, some notes there. I'd have a read as much as I can. If you want to support my channel, please go check out my Patreon account. Yes, it is in the description box below, along with some other cool links like Facebook, my Instagram, I have a merchandise store, all that good stuff. If you want to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future, I would encourage you to click the little bell by the subscribe button. I would like to take a massive thank you to each and every one of you who have been supporting my channel. Those of you who are members or supporters of my channel that have joined my Legion, thank Thank you so much for your support towards my channel and your membership. I will be looking at updating my perks and rewards for those of you who are members of my channel and supporting this YouTube channel. And of those of you who want to become members and get a membership for this channel, all you have to do is click the little join button by the subscribe button to get some cool little features and perks that you would not normally get if you were not part of the membership. I appreciate each and every one of you being here. Have a wonderful rest of your day. All the best. Bye bye.